So the ideas of someone like Elizabeth Gurley Flynn would have been important to many of the people who lived not only in 97 Orchard, but many of the tenements that covered and blanketed Manhattan and Brooklyn and um, much of New York. And so um, we're really excited to welcome Lara Vapnik, who's just written a wonderful biography about Elizabeth Gurley Flynn that just came out. Um, and Lara Vapnik is someone who has worked with us before we had celebrated her first book, Breadwinners, um, which is a wonderful book um, as well about women workers. And um, she was here uh, last fall to talk about Emma Goldman. Um, and she was also here for another to talk about Elizabeth Gurley Flynn in a smaller version. So Lara is someone who is very much part of what we do here and even brought her students here last week or the week before. She teaches at St. John's University. So uh, there was no question that when her book came out, we would host it here and we're so excited to have her here. Um, and then what makes it even more exciting is that she's going to be in conversation with one of her professors and one of my professors, um, Alice Kessler-Harris, who is, um, the historian of women and U.S. history, um, and was at Columbia University, the author of many books, including Out to Work. Um, her most recent book is uh, Lillian, A Difficult Woman, The Challenging Life of Lillian Hellman, which we also were able to celebrate here. So it's wonderful to welcome her back um, and have her in conversation with Lara. Um, also, we have a treat. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn couldn't make it. However, <laughs> we do have an actor who's going to be reading um, a poem that she wrote. Um, so uh, that will happen kind of midway through the program. Um, if you have a second, um, take look at your phones and just make sure the ringers are off. I have to admit that I made that announcement a week ago and I had my own phone on, so I'm going to check too. <laughs> and it did ring. Um, <laughs> all right, so please uh, join me in welcoming Lara Vapnik. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. I love being at the Tenement Museum. And as Annie was saying, I was just here a couple of weeks ago with a group of students from St. John's and going through the apartments with them, I was just so struck by how the conditions in the apartments that are so um, demonstrated so vividly about how working people lived at the turn of the century, how much that really influenced Flynn's activism. So it's just really exciting to be here. And also, I'm just so thankful to Alice for coming. Of course, Alice's scholarship has been a great inspiration to me and to many other people. And her support and encouragement through the years have meant a tremendous amount. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here. From her first appearance as a soapbox speaker on the streets of New York City in 1906 at age 16, through her death in the Soviet Union in 1964, Flynn boldly challenged inequalities of sex and class and insisted on her right to speak freely. She was arguably the most significant woman on the radical left in the 20th century United States but not very much has been written about her. She doesn't really fit into the traditional narrative of women's history, which is more focused in the first half of the 20th century on women winning the vote and winning political rights. And she hasn't had much play in labor history either, despite the fact that she led several significant strikes. And I think this is because she became a communist. And labor historians, as a result of that, really haven't been sure quite what to do with her. Despite these omissions, Flynn embodies the ups and downs of the radical left in the 20th century United States. So in writing this biography, I became convinced that even though we don't know very much about her, she was actually at the center of all of these really important social movements. So I want to tell you just a little bit about her life um, before I get into conversation with Alice. Flynn was born into a radical Irish-American family in Concord, New Hampshire in 1890, but she grew up in the Bronx and she was really a product of New York City. She attended public schools, she participated in the debating society. 
Her mother, Annie Flynn, was a skilled seamstress, and she had migrated from Ireland as a teenager. Her father, Tom Flynn, was Irish-American, and he had grown up working in the main granite quarries. Tom Flynn went to engineering school, and he trained as a map maker. So he seemed kind of on the verge of lifting the family into the middle class, but it just never really happened. And they always hovered on the edge of poverty. His work was quite unsteady. In 1902, Flynn discovered socialism. And she discovered it in the context uh, of an English language program that was being held by German socialists in Harlem. And her family went there on a Sunday, in part because they didn't have much money to do anything else. So they were all, always looking for free entertainment. <laughs> And they were really taken in by what they learned at this meeting. As she recalled, they kind of purchased all of the literature that they could afford. And they came to see, um, as a result of you know, getting exposed to socialism, they came to see capitalism as the source of all of the problems that they saw around them in their working class Bronx neighborhood. And so they looked towards socialism to establish collective ownership of land, natural resources, industries, banks, and communication. And they thought that economic activity should be reorganized to serve the public good rather than to make a profit. By age 16, Flynn was known as the East Side Joan of Arc for her popular <laughs> speeches advocating socialism and critiquing women's oppression under capitalism. And I just love that term, East Side Joan of Arc. Even though she lived in the Bronx, they were associating her with the radicalism of the Lower East Side, because of course, this is where it was all happening. So she would often take the subway downtown to participate in protests, to speak in Union Square or in other um, places downtown. In 1907, she joined the Industrial Workers of the World, a radical new labor group that declared, the working class and the employing class have nothing in common, and urged the workers of the world to organize as a class, take possession of the earth and the machinery of production, and abolish the wage system. Needless to say, this was a revolutionary group. Flynn's parents had taught her to sympathize with the oppressed, and she really liked the fact that the Wobblies were trying to organize the most disempowered workers. They didn't care about the gender. They, they reached out to women. They reached out to African Americans. They reached out to Mexican Americans. They reached out to people in all different kinds of occupations. And this made them very different than the dominant labor, move, uh, labor organization at the time, the American Federation of Labor. Many American socialists thought that change could come by electing socialist candidates to office. that she was agitating for the Wobblies. And she was very proud. They didn't call, that they were, she was called an agitator, right? Just that term of being an agitator, she went in to kind of stir things up. That was her role. Against the advice of her parents and her teachers, she dropped out of high school. By 18, she was married and pregnant, uh, not necessarily in that order. And as her friend, Vincent St. John, remarked, Elizabeth fell in love with the West and the miners, and she married the first one she met. <laughs> so Flynn really did have this romance with the West. And in part, I think it was because she was such a New York City uh, person. She just thought the West was like this romantic place. And she was really taken with the miners and the lumberjacks and the people that she met out there. Flynn's marriage to Jack Jones, the father of her son Fred, was brief, 
And Flynn was able to continue her work in the labor movement because her mother, Annie, and sister Kathy took care of Fred. So she had this son, but in order to care for him, she really needed the help of her family. And one of the interesting things about her is that she lived with, a, with members of her family for most of her life. In 1909 and 1910, Flynn led two of the IWW's first free speech battles in Missoula, Montana, and Spokane, Washington. And Flynn, who was also, she was very, as you can see from this image here, she was very young and beautiful, and she became this very important public symbol of the industrial workers of the world. But she was also a really galvanizing public speaker and an incredibly effective and resourceful organizer, leading tens and thousands of workers who went on strike in Lawrence, Massachusetts in 1912 and Patterson, New Jersey in 1913. And I just have a few images to illustrate. This is uh, Flynn with, I think she's with Big Bill Haywood there. And they are leading some children in Lawrence on the Children's Crusade. And this was this incredibly um, creative technique to kind of build public support for the strike by taking children out of Lawrence and placing them in families in New York City, but also in Philadelphia and Barrie, Vermont. So it got a lot of publicity, but it was also a very practical technique because she really wanted women to participate in the strike. And she knew that they were going to have trouble participating in the protests and continuing to support the strike if they were worried about who was going to be taking care of their children and feeding their children. So by taking the children out of Lawrence, she really facilitated the activism um, of the women in Lawrence, and they were really you know, the leaders of the strike there. And this is another image um, when the strikers actually, a, a group of the children arrived at Grand Central Station in New York City, and they, they staged this parade. And I mean, you can just see the streets are lined with all of these people watching these children from Lawrence come into the city. And people were just um, struck by the fact that these children, a lot of them didn't look particularly well-dressed or well-fed. Um, it was winter, and some of them didn't have warm coats. And so it really helped humanize the conflict in Lawrence in 1912 at a time when there was a lot of hostility still toward immigrants. And this is an image of Flynn in the Patterson silk workers' strike in 1913. And I think what is perhaps captured in this photograph is just what a riveting speaker she was. I mean, you kind of see how everyone is like leaning in. And she talked about the fact that when she spoke, she felt like she established almost an electric link with her audience. And people who heard her speak just never forgot the experience. And then this is um, a poster from the, the pageant that was staged in Madison Square Garden in support of the, um, of the strike. And this is perhaps her most famous image here as the rebel girl. Flynn's social critique was not just economic. Her mother was a very strong feminist who admired intelligent women who did worthwhile things. She actually named Elizabeth after the female doctor who delivered her, which I thought was pretty interesting. And she really encouraged Flynn to pursue her own career, to be self-reliant and self-supporting. Coming of age in early 20th century New York City, Flynn associated with many of the radicals who lived on the Lower East Side and also who lived in Greenwich Village, and she absorbed some more modern feminist ideas such as birth control and free love. Disregarding popular prohibitions against public discussion of sexuality, Flynn insisted that women needed access to birth control in order to time the arrival of their children and limit the size of their families. And in many of her speeches for the IWW or on street corners in New York City and in other places, she insisted on women's right to choose motherhood. So this was a like very powerful new language um, in favor of birth control. 
She also was a very strong critic of marriage. She saw it as no better than legalized prostitution. Um, and she picked up some of this critique from Emma Goldman, who she was very influenced by. But as she saw it, the fact that most women could not support themselves really didn't give them any choice but to get married. But then once they were married, she saw them as kind of, most working class women, as stuck in the situation where they didn't have control over their reproduction. So they would have a lot of children. And they would still have to find ways to contribute to the family economically, either going out to work for wages or maybe taking in outwork or, or borders. So she thought that um, to really truly have equality, women also needed access to birth control and there needed to be social support for motherhood. And that was something that really carried through her whole career. In 1912, Flynn fell in love with Carlo Tresca, a dashing Italian anarchist known for his sharp political instincts, his dramatic public speaking style, and also his skill in seducing women, which apparently was legendary. Um, Tresca moved in with Flynn and her family, and he was a very charming person. He was also a very good cook, so I think the fact that he um, cooked all of this Italian food, really helped win over her family. Flynn and Tresca never got married. As Flynn later explained, this was according to our code at the time, not to remain with someone you did not love, but to honestly and openly avow a real attachment. So this was kind of the ideal of free love. But and this is one of the themes that I talk about in the book. Flynn was very much in favor of free love, but the reality of it proved uh, difficult to live with. In 1925, she discovered that Tresca had been having a long-running affair with her younger sister, sister Bina, um, and the couple had a son. And needless to say, this discovery was devastating. Flynn narrowly escaped indictment during the crackdown on radicalism that began during World War I and culminated in the first Red Scare. And in response to the jailing and deportation of radical workers, she established the Workers' Defense Union, where she built a strong, united front of liberals, pacifists, church leaders, professionals, and labor leaders who argued for the right to express dissenting ideas even during wartime as a fundamental feature of American freedom. And so this group was really important in terms of creating the coalition that supported civil liberties, basically, in the 1920s. She, Flynn herself barely survived the Red Scare. In 1926, she suffered a me mental and physical breakdown. She moved to Portland, Oregon, and withdrew from politics for a decade. Flynn moved in with Marie Acqui, who was a physician and an out lesbian, which needless to say was very unusual for the time. And Flynn uh, Equi was this very um, significant figure in Portland, in radical politics in Portland. People knew her as a very strong advocate for workers' rights. She advocated suffrage. And she was jailed for her opposition to World War I. So I have to say, as ready as I personally was to love Equi, after how badly Flynn had been treated by Tresca, the truth of the matter is that the two women had a, a pretty difficult relationship. I think Aqui was not an easy person to get along with. She had quite a domineering personality, and the relationship was difficult. But for Flynn, I mean, Flynn really lived and died for politics. So for her to be separated from the radical movements that had given her life meaning, meaning was almost like a form of death. And she became very depressed during her time when she was living with a Kui. In the mid-1930s, however, Flynn left a Kui and she returned home to her political life in New York City. And certainly there were radical politics happening in Portland too. She could have gotten involved there. But for her, you know, her, her life was always centered on the New York scene. 
Inspired by the Popular Front, she joined the Communist Party, helping to organize workers who surged into the Congress of Industrial Organizations and campaigning to support and extend the New Deal. And I was just really struck by these two photographs. If you look at her in Portland versus the way that she looked when she came back to New York, and she actually talks about coming back to New York and coming back into politics as being reborn. I mean, for her, it was like a second life to join the Communist Party. And this is a picture of her in Union Square. And she's speaking with Bill Foster and Rose Wardus. And you can just see, I think I like this photograph because it just shows to me that she's so excited to be involved in these radical social movements again. Her politics, I mean, her devotion to socialism stayed steady in many ways, but her politics shifted. In 1942, she ran for representative at large from New York State to the US Congress, winning more than 50,000 votes. And this is sort of remarkable for a woman who actually never voted until she became a communist. So as a wobbly, she opposed, she opposed any kind of political participation. And so for her to vote was actually, she actually wrote in her diary, I cease to be a wobbly. And to her, that was voting, was like crossing the line there. During World War II, she used women's widespread entry into the labor force to argue in favor of opening all jobs to women, regardless of race, and providing federally funded daycare. And so I was really interested in her activism during World War II. I think she really enjoyed the war years, in part because the communists were patriotic, right? The United States was allied with the Soviet Union. She was a very popular speaker. and people were very receptive to her message. And so I think this was a very exciting time for her. But when the war ended in 1945, so too did the United States alliance with the Soviet Union. As the two superpowers battled to shape the new world order, communists like Flynn became internal enemies. So there was a very dramatic about face that happened. And in 1951, Flynn became more than 100 leaders of the Communist Party who were charged with conspiring to advocate the overthrow of the United States government through force and violence. And so I think the key term there is conspiring to advocate. There was no actual you know, conspiracy that was discovered. Um, but this is a mugshot of the first group of communist leaders that were indicted. And then here we have Flynn on the steps of the federal courthouse in Manhattan. And to her left is her friend, Claudia Jones, who she served time in prison with. And then, I'm sorry, it's to her right. And then to her left is Pettis Perry and Betty, Betty Gannett. And in a few minutes, we'll hear a poem that actually describes what she missed about her life when she went to prison. Flynn never actually visited the Soviet Union until 1960. So in 1960, she makes her first visit to the Soviet Union after she gets out of prison. And this was one of my favorite things that I found in my research. It's a postcard that she sent back to her nephew Peter Martin, who was the son of her sister Bina and Carlo Tresca, with whom she actually became very good friends while she was in prison. He became one of her FBI-approved correspondents. And they established this really close relationship. At this point, I think he might have been um, like cat-sitting for her in her apartment in the East Village. And this postcard is just its very characteristic of her. And so I just, I, you know, I kind of had to just pull this out. Um, so writing back in other letters to Martin, she admitted that she enjoyed the VIP red carpet treatment in the Soviet Union. And I think for her, it was kind of shocking that she got there and she was like a celebrity. She was a heroine. I mean, in the United States, she had been jailed for being a communist. And she gets to the Soviet Union and discovers like she's in high demand. You know, everybody wants to talk to her and meet her. She's celebrated. They're throwing parties for her. So it's like this tremendous contrast with her life back in New York City. 
Nonetheless, she had no desire to relocate to the Soviet Union. She liked to visit and she would, you know, kind of go over for spa treatments. She had like terrible arthritis in her knees and they would take, I mean, I think she's not the only person, but a lot of these communist leaders would basically go to the Soviet Union and they, they would be taken care of in a way that they were not taken care of here. Um, so she considered herself, although she appreciated kind of the perks of going to the Soviet Union, she always wanted to stay here and she insisted very strongly on that she was American, right? And that was like one of the big contentions of the Cold War, that communists were not Americans. She said, I am American. And she wanted to stay here and have the right to express her dissenting ideas. So throughout her life, Flynn remained an idealist. And writing her biography, I came to see this both as a strength and a liability. Despite the tremendous repression during the Red Scares that followed World War I and World War II, Flynn spent her life trying, in her own words, to persuade the majority of the American people that socialism would be a happier, more secure, and peaceful, more just and equitable system of society than capitalism is or can be. And she inspired a lot of people with that message. But her loyalty could be a liability. She refused to give up on the dream of a Soviet socialist utopia, even after abundant evidence that the experiment had failed. Despite Flynn's faults, I think that she deserves to be recognized for her key role on the left in 20th century America and to be admired for her fundamental faith in ordinary people organizing to make their lives better and to improve the world. Thank you. And I think we have a poem from <laughs> Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. So this is entitled, What Do I Miss, You Ask, from 1955. Besides freedom, work, my friends, and life, I'm sure you mean, to faithfully answer, the list grows, both great and small. I miss the foghorns on the river at night and the pictures on the wall. I miss the children playing on the sunny street and the corner candy store with good neighbors whom I meet. I miss my sleepy cat my ugly cactus, my treasured books, and a long, leisurely, talky breakfast under Kathy's kindly looks. I miss sleeping until I wake up, and getting up when I can't sleep. I miss turning on the light at my ease and turning off the radio when I please. I miss walking alone at night and seeing the stars and returning to an open door, a window without bars. I miss a key on the inside of the door and a soft wool rug, not rag, to cover the floor. I miss a large bureau with capacious drawers and a long, wide mirror without flaws. Oh, I miss nylon stockings and a colorful dressing gown and leaving the house at will to take a ride around the town. I miss grapefruit and real hot coffee and my big blue French cup uh, and eggs and strawberries, and cream to sup. I miss sardines, and cheese, olives, and beer with the early bird edition at midnight with Giovanni and f other friends set cheer. I miss real movies, unexpurgated, with an audience of men, women, and lively children, and soft voices, and low-pitched laughter. I miss talking to men. Talk about politics, trade unions, families, and friends. I miss soft dresses and underwear gay and gay bright scarves and my watch, my zircon ring, and fountain pen. I miss firm, wide bed, my, my thick walls, my privacy to sleep, unheard to read aloud, to sing a little, even to weep. I miss my name spoken with a proper prefix because it is a long time since I was or felt like a girl. 
I miss the beauty parlor on University Place and Sunny asking, wave or curl? I miss the Hudson River and the East River Drive and the Ewan at night. Oh, and I miss dear old Brooklyn Bridge and the skyline all night. I miss New York and the statue in the bay, LaGuardia Airport, Idlewild, and Union Square in May. And I miss traveling. I miss America. Uh, the Mississippi, the Rocky Mountains, Puget Sound, the Pacific Ocean, and Philadelphia, Detroit, Pittsburgh, and ever lovely San Francisco. Nothing and no one can take my country from me. It is ever in my mind, my heart, my eyes. But most of all, I miss people. My own kind of people. People with ideas, ideals, dreams, hopes of tomorrow. I miss real talks, natural laughter, jokes, persiflage, a sense of humor, people who are objective, who can discuss without prejudice, debate without anger, reason without rancor. I miss people who know what they believe, are willing to suffer and sacrifice for it cheerfully and be true to it, come what may. I miss good plain workers who go to work, belong to unions, help their fellows, love their kids and wives, fur and steel workers, miners and auto workers who lead normal, useful lives. Yes, in this strange hiatus, this temporary withdrawal from a living world, I miss still more the intangibles, hard to define. Personal liberty, the search for happiness, the right to speak my mind. But in my memory, I have all I miss, and in my thoughts, all I seek. So fear not their loss should make me sad or weak. that can last forever and ever. <laughs> so, um, Lara, <laughs> um, I, I want to begin by saying I love the book and then to say that, as usual, and you're used to this, I have a lot more questions than you answered in the book. So, uh, assuming that the audience would also have these questions, let me... Um, uh, pose some of the contradictions I see here and see if you can't help us understand them to make, you know, a kind of fuller picture of her life. Uh, so here's the first one. Uh, I am, as you know, a historian of women, and I watch Elizabeth Gurley Flynn in your book proclaim her loyalty to women and yet, as you tell us, she avoids uh, participating in the women's organizations of her time that might have actually benefited from her voice and her presence. Tell us how you reconcile those two things or how she might have reconciled those two things. Well, I can always count on Alice to ask me the tough questions, um, but that's that, that's a really good one. I think there's a number of different answers. I think part of it is that she was so convinced that the questions of gender and class really couldn't be disentangled. And she just didn't think that the contemporary women's movement was class 
conscious enough. So she really was this very strong socialist, and she did not believe in women's cross-class cooperation. And as you know from my first book, is it's all about women's cross-class cooperation. But of course, there were some problems with cross-class cooperation. Often it was the case that the allies would try to set the agenda for the working women. So I think she didn't like you know, that idea. And then I also think it was this moment where she was very young. You know, it's also had to do with her age, I think, that she was so young in the 1910s, and she thought that it was just more modern for men and women to work together. So part of it, I think, was also a style issue. She never really gravitated to those all-women's movements like the Women's Trade Union League that were really so significant for other working class activists, even people like Lenora O'Reilly, who she actually admired. I mean, she's kind of an interesting comparison because she was also Irish American, and she was very much you know, part of that kind of working class um, feminism, I guess. But for Flynn, she didn't think that women really had a lot, that a, a lot in common that transcended class. At least that was her rhetoric. But you're certainly right, but a lot of these women, I mean, it was interesting to me, a lot of these women actually did become her friends and did support her as she went on. And some of her correspond I was fascinated by the fact that one of her correspondents in prison was Alice Hamilton, who was somebody who had been so active, you know, in these progressive era movements. And so in the end, they kind of all came together and it seemed like they could admire each other. Um, but she even said, somebody asked her, you know, well, why weren't you involved in the suffrage movement? And she said, well, they wouldn't have wanted me in the suffrage movement. I wasn't respectable enough. And I think it was also because she wanted to um, kind of pursue these more modern ideas of freedom and advocate birth control. And she felt like all of this was probably too controversial for the mainstream, wi mainstream women's movement. I, I think as you point out, uh, people should know that Emma Goldman, who was not quite a good friend, but certainly an acquaintance, also refused to have anything to do with the women's suffrage movement. Yeah. But let me push you a little bit, Lara, because <laughs> <laughs> in 1937, 38, 39, when she's in the Communist Party, she does, presumably pushed by the party, engage herself then in specifically women's movements. So she becomes a leader of the Women's Shoppers League. Mm -hmm. She's an organizer of the Congress of American Women right mm -hmm. after the mm -hmm. war. And so it seems as though when somebody's pushing her, she's willing to give up that principle of not working across class. I don't know that it was so much, I, I mean, I guess to me what I see is that she, she was principal, but she also was pragmatic. She sort of had a sense of what could be pushed when. Um, for example, during World War II, that's the era when she's so outspoken about conditions of women's work, and I think she sees, well, this is an opportunity here. With Rosie the Riveter, I can get out and advocate equality. And then in the 30s, I think, you know, she was really connecting with the Popular Front, and I don't think it was something that she was just pushed into, because she really admired female leaders of the Communist Party, people like Anita Whitney, for example, or Mother Bloor. I mean, I think they had, you know, genuine friendships. So I think you're right. I mean, the Communist Party, you know, had kind of a different take on things than, than the Wobblies had at least during the 1930s. But part of what's tricky about her and what's hard to get a handle on is, I mean, she has such a long career and her rhetoric definitely changes with the times. You know, So in the 30s, she was much more in that kind of popular front mode of speaking in general terms, but then once um, Bill Foster comes in and starts directing the party in the 50s, I mean, she does adapt much more that kind of like rhetoric that's like,
and class conscious. So the class consciousness, I think, in her rhetoric kind of comes and goes. But I think it's, it, it's always there. It's like these two threads, as I see, are always there. It's just at certain points, some are kind of pulled out more prominently than others. And it's possible, this is the last push on the women's <laughs> question, but it's possible that the women's equality also just comes and goes. And here I'm thinking specifically about motherhood and her proclamations of women's, uh, you know, women should be able to choose motherhood, meaning they should also be able to choose not to be mothers. But she actually has a baby boy when she's 19 years old. And that little boy gets raised by her mother and her sister while she's off gallivanting in the West. <laughs> now, there's got to be a little bit of a contradiction in a woman who says, I'm all for motherhood and people being good mothers and being allowed to be good mothers. Mm -hmm and yet she abandons her own child to her mother and her sister while she becomes an equal woman. I mean, certainly it was a difficult situation for her son. There's no doubt, there's no doubt about that. I think as she saw it, she had a larger role to play. And she was very much, I mean, she sort of says in her memoir, it was hard to be a female revolutionary. Um, but I guess to counter, you know, there are male revolutionaries that have children too, and they're not necessarily <laughs> blamed for, you know, leaving their children at home with their, their wives. And in, in some respect, I think her family, like her mother and her sister, almost play like a wife-like role to enable her activism. And I would say, I mean, there are moments when you go through her papers and you sort of find these like forlorn cards from Fred, who was her son, and it, it is really sad. But I think it was really sad for her too. I mean, I think she found the separation difficult, but she was really deeply convinced that her work was so important and that she couldn't do it and be a full-time mother at the same time. Uh, well, that's something that we should leave in abeyance since I'm sure lots of people in this room have some of the same contradictions. Or uh, let, let me um, open up another contradiction, um, free speech. So here's a woman who all her life advocates uh, the right to speak freely. Uh, she's a champion, as we learn late in her life, of the Bill of Rights. And yet, uh, she's a woman who joins the Communist Party in the 1930s at a period when uh, Foster is about to take over. And Foster, for those of you who don't know, William Foster was a leader of the Communist Party who had a very tight reign on the American Communist Party, unlike uh, the person who he ousted Earl Browder, but Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, you know, she advocates free speech, but she willingly uh, accedes to the non-freedom that is required of the of Communist Party members. Can you talk about that a little bit? <laughs> it's definitely a contradiction. There's no, there's no doubt about that. I think that part of it is that, I guess there's a number of different answers to it. Part of it is her conception of free speech included the right to express any kind of dissenting idea. And so certainly socialism or communism or anarchism, those were all dissenting ideas. And she thought every American had the right to express whatever political ideas they wanted. Um, so there's that kind of side of it. In terms of going along with the Communist Party, I think that she just thought that the party was sort of the best chance for socialism in the United States. And it was really interesting to me that she actually didn't join the party until the 1930s, until the Popular Front 
which was the era when the party was really reaching out and was being, you know, was more open to different kinds of social movements and was bringing in different kinds of people. She didn't join um, when it started in, in 1919. And that was, she didn't join in the 20s really when she was part of the Workers' Defense Union. So she kind of held herself aloof from it. And I read that as her kind of wariness of the party. Um, but in the popular front, when the party became such a central kind of feature of the American left, she just jumped in with, with both feet. And yet, unlike many people, she stayed in the party in during and after the Nazi-Soviet aggression pact. And while we completely understand the kind of unity she felt and the patriotism she felt about staying in the party in World War, uh, during World War II, after the war, uh, when, uh, particularly by the 1950s, when the Khrushchev revelations revealed the purges and Stalin's really vicious inhumanity, not a peep out of her about, about these things. Right, well part of the reason, part of what was interesting to me was that Khrushchev's speech actually happened while she was in prison. So while she was in prison for being a communist, that's when she reads these allegations are coming out in the New York Times. So that was one of the newspapers that she could read. And she's kind of shocked by it. And she writes to a friend. She said, you know, how could this have happened for so long? And we didn't really know what was happening in the United States. But in a weird way, I think there's something about her imprisonment that actually cemented her allegiance to the party. She thought that it was so unfair and wrong that she had been put in prison for trying to make America a better place. And I think she genuinely believed that that's what she was doing, that I think it actually kind of pushed her, sort of cemented her allegiance at a time when a lot of people were leaving. And then there were just also the issues of personal loyalty. I mean, I think loyalty was a big theme in her life. And a lot of people that left became informants for the FBI, or they wrote these tell-all memoirs, and she just thought that they weren't good people, basically. You know, that they weren't respectful of their friends and the other people in the movement. And so she kind of soldiered on, even though I think certainly she had her doubts toward the end of her life. But it was, at that point, I think almost too late for her to do anything else. Yeah, you, you certainly um, emphasize in the book that sort of personality trait of loyalty and commitment. So she remains loyal to the IWW, even when Big Bill Haywood starts to advocate violence. She, uh, who, who hates violence and has opposed it all her life, nevertheless just sort of just doesn't go along with the violence. She tries to fight it within the IWW. But she also doesn't leave the IWW on those grounds. But there is about that loyalty also, um, should we call it a sense of naivety? Or, I mean, here she is bitterly betrayed by uh, Carlo Tresca, for example, her lover. And yet she comes back into a reasonable relationship with him, with, her, with the sister with whom Tresca had a, a child. She, you know, what, what are we to think of such a woman? She, you know, she, she's one of the founding members of the ACLU, and yet the ACLU expels her in 1940 because she will not resign from the Communist Party. There's another instance of, you know, and yet she doesn't denounce the ACLU. Roger Baldwin remains her friend, even though he has scurrilously, scurrilously treated her. But was she just a naive well, young woman or is I, she I don't think she was naive. I mean, her relationships, she she definitely did have long friendships. That's true. And when she comes back, she sort of 
She sees Tresca when she comes back in the 30s, but she's pretty happy to denounce him as a Trotskyite. Um, so I think she was happy to have a reason to, you know, say he was wrong. And that was more acceptable, of course, than talking about the fact that he had had an affair with her sister. So they certainly, you know, they're divided politically by the 1930s. Um, and in terms of Roger Baldwin, no, they had they had a terrible falling out. I mean, they good. They you had a terrible. <laughs> oh yeah, they had a terrible falling out. I mean, she just thought that he was completely unprincipled, basically. I mean, the ACLU doesn't come off too well in this in this book, um, which I sort of regretted because I think you know today the ACLU is this great. You know, to me, there's still a very strong voice for free speech. But what you see is that in the context of the Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact and all of the hostility to communism, they you know, were just trying to jettison Flynn because they were trying to save themselves from being called communists. And even though Flynn had been a founding member of the organization, so she really never apologized for that. And she also, you know, called them out and said, look, you're turning civil liberties into something that's just for lawyers and ministers. And it started out as a working class movement, you know, but she said it's basically the working class has gotten too radical for you. You know, that was sort of how she, how she put it. So if we can move to the 1950s a little bit and just pursue this, uh, we just heard a wonderful poem, uh, beautifully read, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the poem is about love for America. Now, here's another thing that puzzles me. <laughs> here's this woman who is in jail at the time, and she, like the 12 uh, communists who've been convicted under the Smith Act, which itself should have been declared un unconstitutional because it violated all the provisions of free speech. Here she and her friends, her partners, have all been abysmally treated by the United States. And yet, she's writing a poem in prison saying, you know, well, I miss my cup, my blue coffee cup, but I love the United States. Uh, is there something wrong with this woman that <laughs> she did not denounce the United States or some part of it? I think she was a true believer. That is the only way to understand her. She was a true believer. She believed in America. She believed in the America of people like Eugene V. Debs. She saw the socialist tradition as really being part of the American tradition. She noted in a letter to, prison, uh, to her sister from prison, she said, um, Susan B. Anthony was arrested for voting. Abolitionists were arrested. So she really saw herself in this tradition of American descent, you know, of dissenters, of abolitionists, of women's rights advocates who had pointed out flaws in America. And then there had been change, you know, there had been constitutional amendments that followed. So she kind of imagined, I think, you know, a little bit, you could say maybe this was naive, um, but she hoped that there could be kind of a parallel shift in terms of a change in the economic system in America. So let me ask you a little bit about race in this context. There's not a mention of Paul Robeson in the book, and Robeson is a direct contemporary, and we know that he turns to communism after being uh, rejected on all kinds of other levels. And at this point in the 1950s, he's lost his passport, he can't travel, uh, he's been uh, dismissed, essentially, uh, not, not because he's a party member, but because he imagines himself a communist with a small C. 
And yet, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn doesn't ally herself with him before she goes to jail. She, she actually, she had great admiration for Paul Robeson, and I think she might have even written a poem about his voice. He's just one of the people, it's a short biography, so he's one of the people that, for better or for worse, you know, I, I got got cut out. But um, one of the things that she actually really valued about the party was that it was so inclusive of African Americans. So that was really important to her. And she had she had tremendous admiration for Paul Robeson. And they, they they weren't friends really, but they shared the stage, you know, on some on some occasions. Could could you tell us some of the things that she did to advocate racial equality? Yeah, well, it really came out um, the most clearly during the World War II era. So when she was on the road for the party during World War II, she was extremely critical of um, workplace segregation. So she basically said, you know, people are, women are coming into jobs and there, there shouldn't be any bars in terms of gender and there also shouldn't be any bars in terms of race. So she was very adamant that African Americans and women deserved equal opportunities in the workplace. And when she spoke um, during her campaign for Congress, she really made a special outreach actually to African American audiences. And the Communist Party was very strong in places like Harlem. It appealed to a lot of African Americans. And then also she was, ex she was very close friends with um, Claudia Jones. You saw that, that photograph there. She tried to um, campaign against Jones being deported, although Jones eventually, Jones was deported. She was taken out of prison and sent to England, but she was very partisan, you know, in favor of Jones, organizing, fundraising, you know, so she, I think in, you know, in that respect, she was pretty active. And she also, she spoke out, um, she spoke out against the lynching that followed World War I. So that was something that she spoke out about, really at that point not aligned either with the IWW or with the Communist Party, but during that period where she was part of the Workers' Defense Union, she definitely saw that as an issue. Some of that lynching, of course, was of white, um, uh, white workers, white wobbly, the remaining wobbly members and the radicals, so yeah. that was yeah. too. But uh, Laura, let me ask you a last question perhaps and then perhaps people in the audience will have questions. We'll have easier questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, is it that bad? <laughs> So oh, this is this is a softball question. <laughs> at the end of a book, at the end of the book, in the concluding section, you tell us that, and and it's your phrase. She wrote herself into history, and you use that phrase, uh, you know, when you're trying to describe the final autobiographical volume that she wrote. Uh, you know, it's easy enough for all of us to write ourselves into history, but tell us a little bit about what she said about herself that convinced you as a historian that she actually deserved a place in history. I thought this was the easy question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think that her autobiography, The Rebel Girl, which covered just the first 20 years of her career, from 1906 to 1926, I mean, in that way, she wrote herself into history because she talks about the role that she played in these free speech battles in places like Missoula and Spokane. She talks about Lawrence and Patterson. She talks about a lot of more obscure labor conflicts that people might not necessarily know about. And then she also just talks about other people in the IWW, so her relationships with people in the IWW. Um, 
But in a way, you know, the book can be actually hard for people to pick up because she, it's full of so many other people. I mean, in a funny way, she sort of effaces herself, even as she's trying to write herself into history. She's sort of emphasizing all of these other people that she worked with. And then one of the things that's kind of fascinated me, and I'm, I'm working on a related article about this, is that she couldn't seem to write beyond that. She could never write about the period in the, from the 20s to the 30s where she lived with Marie Acqui because that was not acceptable biography, autobiography for a communist leader. So that became this kind of stumbling block. And then she couldn't really write about the communist years either because it was not permissible for people to have any critique. You know, the only sort of communist autobiography that would have been acceptable was sort of, you know, heroic deeds of great leaders. And so I think she could write this early period and it was sort of okay by communist standards because it was so removed and it was so heroic in a lot of ways, but she couldn't really write the later period. Um, and that's something, you know, that interests me. She kind of, she has these sort of stabs at autobiography and she says, well, the first volume, you know, this is just the first volume and I'm going to write a second volume and I'm going to write it to show people like Roger Baldwin that my second life was a continuation of my first life. So she very much wants to do it, but she can never figure out really how to do it. So you're saying that in some ways the second life was not a continuation of the first life. I but think, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, just that the second life was really constrained in all kinds of ways by the party membership. I think it was constrained by the party, and I think her ability to narrate it was, was really constrained. I mean, I think that in a lot of ways there were continuities and that she saw, she really saw um, the Communist Party as being a continuation of the Wobblies. And of course, you know, she was not alone. A lot of people that started off in the Wobblies went into the Communist Party. And there were a lot of continuities in terms of the people that she worked with. And that was all very important to her, those personal relationships. But she couldn't narrate that kind of second two-thirds of her life, which I think really does suggest some of the limitations, you know, that were imposed on her and she imposed on, upon herself by becoming a communist, you know? Right. Okay. Thank you, <laughs> Lara. <laughs> Questions? Do you want to... Um, should I... Okay. <laughs> Um, so, Margaret Sanger seems to be a contemporary with a lot of parallels um, in terms of someone who used the language of choice and who worked in the birth control movement and also as someone who sort of abandoned her family in um, favor of becoming an activist. And um, that said, I'm wondering if um, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn had a relationship with Sanger or with the um, birth control movement beyond what you've already touched on? Yeah, that's a great question. Flynn and Sanger both advocated birth control, so they were, fr they actually remained friends for decades, but their friendship started around probably 1906, 1907, and then Sanger also helped Flynn organize the children's crusade, so she helped vet the families that would take the children, Sanger was also very good friends with Marie Acqui, and she remained friends with Flynn. I'm trying to think, it probably at least through the through the 1930s. And like I say, it's a short biography, so some of these relationships get a bit truncated here. Um, but she lent money to Elizabeth Gurley Flynn and also to other members of her family. So she was she was a friend. Um, did her, okay, her son, since she abandoned him and everything, did he even, like, follow what she did later on? Did he even share his, her ideals and ideas, or was, did he just go on his own and just live a normal life out of the limelight? <laughs> That's a great question. There's actually this 
kind of funny letter that she writes to her friend. I think it must be, to, I'm not sure if it's to Alice Inglis or Mary Heat and Vorse, who were lifelong friends that she corresponded with. And she says to a friend, I think it's when she's living in Oregon, and she writes, like, Buster's not much of a radical. And it's just like, he had too much of it when he was young. And she's sort of disappointed. He's not really a revolutionary. Um, but later on in the 1930s, he actually becomes active in the American Labor Party, and she was very proud of him when he did that. And one of the things that was sort of poignant to me was that when she comes back to New York in the mid-30s, she really establishes a relationship with Buster as an adult. She was definitely not a great mother to him as a child, but as an adult, they really become friends but he dies very young. He had lung cancer, and so he died very suddenly. Um, thank you so much, and I also want to stop and acknowledge Kathleen Fletcher, who did the wonderful reading, who's an educator here at the Tediment Museum. So also every day in our building, we talk about um, this date, March 25th, 1911, um, as part of our tour, and of course today is March 25th, 1911, and I remember when I was scheduling this, I thought, let's do this this day. But then now, and I know we talked about it, and I'm, I'm forgetting it, so I'm asking again. What did, you know, given that she's like the Joan of Arc of the Lower East Side, and all of her association she had with the Union Square, and she's friends with Leonora O'Reilly, and like, did she, what did she have to say? With, was she part of the voices? Did she give a speech? Was she at Metropolitan Opera House when Rose Schneiderman gave her speech? Or was her, was this kind of seen as the movement that came about afterwards, was it kind of, was it two women trade union league? Was that part of that kind of like, that was not her thing that she was going to advocate for? She would rather be out west. I actually looked this up before I came because I actually, a friend reminded me, she said, it's the anniversary of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. And I was like, oh yeah, that's why we're doing it on March 25th. And I think I had emailed you and said, it's important to her in a way, but she was not directly involved, although she does remember that the day that it happened, she was actually at a meeting where people were discussing whether textile workers or garment workers should join the IWW or they should join one of the other unions, like the Amalgamated or the ILGWU. And so she was on the side, of course, of workers join, joining the IWW. And at this point, these different unions were kind of competing for workers. I mean, she was very much saw this as a terrible tragedy and indicative of the way that capitalism treated workers. But she thought they should join the IWW. And she also discusses in her memoir, she talks about the fact that the shop where it happened, that they never unionized, and that's why they didn't have good safety conditions. But she also criticizes the ILGWU for not having enough female leaders. You know, she says it, it's all these women that are organizing, but all of the leaders were men. So it, it might be helpful for everybody to know that the IWW is not a trade union. The IWW was a workers' organization which had no members because it didn't believe in membership or organization. And so it would go off to wherever it went off and, and run a strike or and even at times win a strike and campaign for free speech for workers. And then the leadership would pull out and disappear and that was the end of that. So. Whereas the ILG might have won fewer strikes, might have been much less noble in its claims to socialism, but at least when it organized, it had a membership that it stuck by. But the difference between those two, I think, is significant for Elizabeth Gurley Flynn because the argument about whether the ILG, which was male-led, was better than the IWW, which also didn't have very many women in its leader, leadership, and, but, but would abandon the people it had previously organized, is a real 
question for Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. I mean, you don't really, ex I, I promise not to ask any more questions, <laughs> but you don't really explain to us why she was so hostile to the trade union movement. I mean, lots of people were hostile to it and one can't blame them, but she seemed to really... Uh... I think she just saw them as being, for the most part, divisive. I mean, she saw their focus on skilled workers as just being very limited, and she thought that the economy was in this direction where nobody would have any skill. And so there was no point. She thought skill was sort of an outdated notion. And she just thought that workers' organizations could be more successful if they really tried to bring everybody in. And so that was one of the reasons that she gravitated toward the IWW instead of the trade union movement. I joined the party in 37. This was pretty much the finish of all the show trials. Did she have any doubts? Did she ever express any doubts about having all the old bullshit today? That's a good question. She, other, her friends sort of took her aside and said, you know, people like Tresca and Giovanniti, who she knew from. Lawrence, and we actually discover from the poem that she remained friends with him into the 1950s. A lot of these people kind of were like, "What are you doing? You know, this is this is not a good idea." But this was it was the peak of the Popular Front. I mean, and that is a quandary of anybody who writes about the the history of communism is that the peak of the Popular Front happened at the same time as the Moscow show trials, and it was like these. People just kind of wrote it off. They thought it was exaggerated. You know, there were a number of different excuses. I think in her case, she was really focused. She was, she really did consider herself an American. She was very focused on what the party could do in America. And I think she probably thought an American Communist Party might be different than a Soviet Communist Party. You know, she saw it as kind of a better organized version of the Wobblies and the Socialists, a group that actually had effective organization. And I think that's another reason that she was receptive to the Communist Party is because in retrospect, she just thought the IWW, they weren't, they weren't great organizers. They sort of organized all these things and then they all, and then the initiatives would sort of fall apart. So I think the fact that the communists were such good organizers, that was something that drew her to the party. She thought that maybe they would just be more effective. I think you said that um, she ended up, she died in the Soviet Union, Is that, am I remembering right? So um, how did she end up there, and was she by then deeply alienated from the United States, or what was going on? <laughs> well, they took away her passport, so uh, the United States tried to kind of banish her, but she managed to get it back, and that was kind of one of her last battles, was the battle to get her passport back, because she said the right to travel freely is a fundamental American right, and you can't take it away just because somebody has a dissenting political opinion. Um, so that trip to the Soviet Union was shortly after her passport was restored, and I think in a way it was to kind of show, like, look, I can, I can travel. But she also, she would go over there periodically to speak. Um, she was actually hoping to make progress on the second volume of her autobiography, so she actually brought a lot of her notes with her. So she was just going over there, you know, probably she just thought for a few months to write or to work, but she never had any intention of moving there permanently. It, it feels like a great irony to me that this great advocate of free speech dies in the Soviet Union, which lionizes her for not speaking the truth about the <laughs> Soviet Union. So. Yeah, she's given this huge state funeral, which is part of her sort of heroic, you know, image in the Soviet Union. Hi, um, this is for Lara, but you can do a tag team response <laughs> if you want. But listening to you and listening to Professor Kessler-Harris's questions, 
I wonder if it's fair to say that when you're in the Communist Party, there are no like reform communists and conservative communists. There are only orthodox communists. And in a way, to be part of that party, you've made your one intellectual stand. And then you radically compromise your intellectual independence. And I, if that's fair, and I guess that's a question for you, if that's fair, then I wonder if we can rethink a lot of the questions about her position, free speech and so forth. There are no ironies once you accept that she's committed to the Communist Party because she thinks as she's told to think, and that's the way the party operated. Unlike, say, the Socialist Party, where you can have a thousand positions and still be a socialist? Well, to be fair, uh, and I think since I've been critical, we should be fair, uh, in the mid-1930s, in the Popular Front period, it was in fact possible to be a member of the Communist Party and not to feel quite as constrained as would of course later be the case. Uh, certainly was the case by 47, 48, 49. And it was also true that in 36, 37, 38, while Earl Browder still had a position of some authority, there was internal debate within the American Communist Party. So it's quite possible for her not to feel as though she was selling her soul, even if she disagreed with some of the positions of the party. She could not have known that loyalty would demand that by the end of the 1940s, she had to either shut up and play ball or get out. Yeah, I think you know she didn't just do exactly as she was told. She disagreed sometimes even with Bill Foster, and they would have their disagreements. When the communists were, the leaders were arrested in the late 1940s and early 1950s, she thought that there should be a civil liberties defense, that they should try to assemble a united front. She looked back to the case of Sacco and Vanzetti, which she had been very instrumental in um, organizing, you know, a response to that. So, but Foster didn't agree with her and didn't listen to her. She didn't like the strategy of sending leaders underground, but she was ignored. But you know, that's part of what happens if you're in an organization. I mean, that could be any organization. The Communist Party is perhaps a little bit extreme, but you know, people belong to organizations and they go along with what the organization does sometimes, even if they don't agree with all of it. Um, so, I mean, I think the Communist Party is sort of a more extreme version of that. And then also, as Alice suggests, what the party was really did shift over time. It wasn't just a single, you know, monolithic entity throughout her whole participation in it. It's also true that by the late 40s, it was liberal Americans who denied the right of the communists to a civil liberties defense as well. So... You know, I don't want to sort of cast aspersions here on Foster for not. It's clear that her strategy, if the strategy had um, uh, been able to be affected, might actually have changed the course of American anti-communism. Yeah. But, of course, it didn't, and it couldn't, so... Yeah, and I think that's just, that was one of the things when she was in prison that she seemed to reflect on and kind of regret the most is that the Communist Party, she just felt like they had lost all of their allies on the left. And when she got out, she worked really hard to rebuild some of those alliances. But of course, you know, there was only so much a single person could do. Perhaps this should be the last. Oh, there's one Thanks. more question. Um, thanks. It's been a great talk. Thank you. And um, I wanted to ask both of you a question, not so much about her, but your, it's a little bit of like your own opinion of how much you think things have really changed for women in listening to her struggles 
and Emma Goldman, I've read that book too. Um, it's easy to look, say that th things have changed, but then it's also, there's a lot of evidence, both for women and for disenfranchised people, uh, as capitalism has, has disenfranchised so many people, um, that things haven't changed at all. You know, I don't mean to <laughs> sound, you know, pessimistic or, or um, but I was interested, I'd just be interested to know both your opinion in how much you really think her underlying fights and causes have actually, how much they've been addressed? Do you want me to go first? <laughs> um, I get that question a lot, as you can imagine, and I always answer that question by saying, uh, I think things have changed, and they've changed dramatically, and the fact that we're sitting here is one indication of that. Uh, but I don't think they've changed enough yet. And therefore, if I were to apply that question to Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, I'd say her struggle, um, she, 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 the kinds of things she struggled for have achieved some level of success. But of course, we're nowhere near um, reaching the kind of equality, if you want to call it that, or hum humanist feminism, if you want to call it that, that uh, Flynn would have advocated, and I think most of us would advocate. So on the issue of reproductive rights, we're you know, still battling. Uh, on uh, the issue of the capacity to speak and have political voice, We've gone a good distance, but you know we haven't gone as far as we should go, so women who run for office still face problems. On the issue of workplace equality, you can answer that question as well as I can. We're certainly better off than we were in 1900, but we're not where we should be. On the issue of family, family equality, uh, we're nowhere near where we might be. So the answer is that the glass is half full, but there's another half to go. <laughs> well, I think over the course of her life, Flynn saw tremendous change. And even though she didn't support the suffrage movement, in retrospect, she actually thought that it was a huge shift in consciousness when women gained political rights. And when she was out campaigning, one of the questions she would ask the audience is, what do you think the Congress would look like if half of the representatives in it were women? And that's still a relevant you know, question to ask. And so I think, as, as Alice suggested, that's an area where there's definitely still more change um, that could happen. You know, in the area of economic inequality, that is just a persistent problem. And I don't think that that has really gotten better. If anything, it's gotten more complicated. It's very globalized. And, you know, I would suggest in her era, one of the interesting things about having communism as this kind of enemy out there was that America kept having to show that capitalism was was a better bet for workers, that actually people would be better off in a capitalist society than a, a communist society. So I would suggest, ironically, you know, with the fall of communism, that, that kind of counterweight has been lost. And now we're at a point where capitalism just kind of seems like the only solution. So in certain ways, I think our range, our imagination for the political possibilities might have actually narrowed from what it was 100 years ago. So I want to thank Lara, and I want to thank Alice, and I want to thank um, all of you, and I want to particularly thank the last question, um, because the kind of the mission of the Tenement Museum, as they told us in the film, is to connect past to present, right? How do we take what we learned about the past to be thinking about what's going on today? Um, and another person in the film said at the end that there's still more work to do. So I invite you to come back and help us do that work. Um, and one way, one of the things, just to plug the Tenement Museum, and if you want to become more active in it, 
becoming a member to the of the Tenement Museum enables you, you know, to visit whenever you want, but it also sets aside funds for us to do ESOL language classes that are free for the people taking them and also subsidizes the school programs that we do. And most of the school children who visit us are um, immigrants or the children of immigrants living in New York. So um, supporting the Tenement Museum, I mean, there's many things to do to fight. I'm not saying <laughs> the only way to fight and fight for social equality is to support the Tenement Museum, but wanted to, to, to do that plug since I'm here. Um, on another note, um, there is, um, if you would like to um, purchase this book, which is a wonderful book, you can do that um, tonight here at the shop, and there's a 15% discount. I'm really putting on my capitalist hat here. And then, um, <laughs> then to add to that, we have another deal with um, Russ and Daughters, a wonderful long-standing restaurant on the Lower East Side, a century old, has opened up a new cafe across the street, and they want us to continue the conversation. So um, Lara, Alice, and I will be dining there, and if, for those of you who dine there, if you show proof of purchase of a book at the Tenement Museum, you get 10% uh, off the, your meal there. So that's just a couple things to keep in mind. Next week we have Jennifer for Eight Lee talking about her film, um, The Search for General Chow's Chicken, which is amazing, um, about how in uh, she goes to China to look at the food that we call Chinese food and finds many, many interesting things. Um, we have also in April a celebration, 50-year celebration of the, um, the Heart Cellar Act. Um, and with uh, Commissioner uh, Nisha Agarwal, sociologist Nancy Foner, wonderful people will be here to discuss that evening. So please take our um, bookmark that gives you a list of all of these events, again, all free. Buy books, eat at Russ and Daughters, and please join me again in thanking Lara and Alice and Kathleen. Thank you.